the, the intricacies of legal English, a language that serves as, as a cornerstone of effective communication within the legal realm and legal professions. As we uh, embark on this uh, journey, uh, we're guided by the uh, vision of um, fostering a deep understanding of legal terminology, uh, enhancing communication skills, and uh, promoting uh, international legal discourse now. So uh, I extend, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start my speech with extending my deepest gratitude to our distinguished uh, speakers who have graciously accepted our invitation uh, to share their insight, their expertise, and uh, the, the, the presence uh, of them enriches our program and elevates this uh, discourse to a new heights. So uh, I would also like to uh, express my gratitude to the, uh, to the yeah. university authorities, the organizing committee, the faculty and the department members who have uh, worked tirelessly uh, to bring this event uh, to, to reality and uh, also uh, have uh, input their uh, deepest commitment. So uh, in conclusion, <clears throat> I wish everyone a rewarding and um, inspiring experience throughout the Legal English Week. Uh, so we've um, designed it to uh, organize um, five sessions starting from today, and uh, the sessions are going to last till December the 1st. So I will uh, wish you all uh, to, to, to put maximum effort in taking part in uh, all of the sessions and uh, may our shared commitment to the, to the mastery of legal English foster um, a legacy of effective communication and collaboration in the in the legal real. So thank you all and uh, let the Engl Legal English Week commence. I would uh, love to give the floor to our uh, moderators, Ms. Uh, Nigora. Uh, Ms. Nigora is going to uh, take it from here and uh, set up all the uh, regular uh, features. So Ms. Nigora, floor is yours. Thank you all. Uh, I think we're experiencing a little technical problems now. Uh, is, is it audible to 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 everyone? Not to Patrick, me. No, not okay. Good. So, Ms. Nagora, I guess. <laughs> okay, let me continue. Uh, first, let me introduce myself before starting my speech. Uh, my name is Mahbuba Rasulba, and my, uh, I am one of the ESP teachers of uh, Foreign Languages Department at SU. Uh, before starting our webinar, uh, I would like to give brief information about today's lecturer, Mr. Patrick Mustu. Uh, it is with great pleasure and honor that I stand before you today to introduce our distinguished guest. Uh, based in the vibrant city of Düsseldorf, Germany, Mr. Mustu is a legal luminary, language trainer, and translator who expertise has left indelible mark on the intersection of law and language. As a lawyer, Mr. Mustu hasn't only honed his legal acumen, but has, has also become a trailblazer in bridging the linguistic gaps within the legal profession. His commitment to effective communication in the field of law has led him to establish himself as a premier in-house language trainer, providing invaluable linguistic insights to law and accounting firms. Through his work, he hasn't only facilitated the mastery of legal, legal English, mm -hmm. but has also empowered profession, professionals to navigate the complexities of international legal discourse with uh, finance. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mustu's influence uh, extends beyond the training room mm -hmm. as he has become a prominent voice in legal publications. His contributions to Germany's leading magazine for paralegals underscore his dedication yes. to sharing knowledge and best practices within the legal community. Through his writings, he has become a source of inspiration 
for aspiring legal professionals and a bacon for those seeking to enhance their language skills in the legal domain. In addition to his training and writing endeavors, Mr. Musto has also read several acclaimed books, including Realizing Claims in Germany, English for Insolvency, English for Tax Returns, and English for Tax Professionals. These publications stand testament to his comprehensive understanding of the legal and linguistic intricacies involved in these specialized fields. His book, books have become indispensable resources for practitioners and students alike, providing practical insights and linguistic tools to navigate the complexities of these legal domains. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not only Mr. Musto's professional accomplishments that distinguish, distinguish him, but also his unwavering commitment to advancing the legal profession through the power of language. Today, we are privileged to, him, to have him with us as he shares his expertise and insights during this enlightening session. And please join us in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Patrick Musto. We eagerly anticipate the knowledge and wisdom he will impact, impart during our time together today. Thank you, all of you. Now, Mr. Musto, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Okay, hello everybody, good to see you all. Um, well, everything has been said, so I think we'll get straight to the topic. Uh, please bear in mind, I'm primarily a legal English trainer that trains practitioners. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you away today from university, and we're going to take a look at one of the very practical areas of, of law. Um, I teach practitioners, so I teach lawyers, legal professionals, and uh, also legal assistants. And we agreed to kick off this week with a talk on intellectual property law. So, and there is English, there is legal English, and there is also intellectual property English, if you like. And I'm going to talk about that because there are not that many fields that are as international as intellectual property law and intellectual property, you know, because everywhere, in almost every country, you can protect your ideas, you can protect patents, you can protect trademarks um, and other IP rights. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. As I've put down here, intellectual property is a truly international field with a truly international English. And this is also a very special English. So when you're at university and you go through all these English programs at university, of course, you learn some general English, you learn some business English, you also learn some legal English. But even within the legal English world, IP, intellectual property, plays a special role. Because here we have special languages. We've got the language of IP laws, which we always have to look at and observe. And we've got the language of IP offices. You know, these are the ones we are dealing with when we are applying for a patent or when we want to register a trademark. And both things here come in because all of these, they use a very special vocabulary you are usually not confronted with in other areas of law. There might be a lot of words you are familiar with in other areas of law, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in intellectual property law, and you have to get used to a completely different lingo, you know, lots of different vocabularies. And we will take a look at this today. <clears throat> so what is intellectual property all about? Here you've got some points. What can be protected? We've got patents, we've got trademarks, we've got utility models. Uh, there is copyright, which usually does not have to be uh, protected, which arises automatically, and there are designs. So in many, many countries, these IP rights can be protected through 
registration. And of course, uh, the majority of IP rights we are confronted with are either patents or trademarks. One of the most famous trademark you see here, the Coca-Cola one and the Coca-Cola bottle. Both of these are actually protected IP rights. This is the logo, also, curl, also called a word figurative mark. And this is the shape of the bottle, which you can also protect, and Coca-Cola has protected it as a design. Um, by the way, everybody, please mute your microphones because otherwise we're going to have some background noise. So everybody who is online, please make sure that your microphones are switched off and that you only switch it on in case you have a question. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's a little text on patents. What is it about? Patents give you the right to prevent third parties from exploiting an invention for commercial purposes without authorization. The word exploit is a special word we use in IP law when we want to say use or make use of something. Usually in English, the word exploit is quite negative. You know, when you exploit somebody or you exploit something or you exploit a situation, usually you take advantage uh, to the detriment of somebody else. This is not the meaning here. To, to exploit an IP right is very, very common. You have an idea, you get a patent, you protect it. Yeah. Hello, we still have these background noises. So you must mute your microphones. Turn your microphones off, please. Thank you. So, and when you go for a patent, you must disclose your invention, which means patents are granted, but they are also published, making them a primary source of information. There are several reasons why you might want to patent something and get protection. And one thing is to exploit your patent by allowing somebody else to use it. So you can grant a license. You can enter into a license agreement with somebody and you allow somebody else to use your patent. And in return, you earn some money from the person using your patent. The person using your patent is the licensee. So you grant a license to the licensee you are the licensor with OR at the end. And the money you agree on is called either a license fee or a royalty. Both refers to the same thing. So there's a certain amount of money that you get uh, in return for granting somebody else the right to use your patent. You can also exploit the patent yourself, but you can also license its use and generate income through it. Because patent law is very international, the requirements are usually the same all around the world. And these are the three requirements. If you, if you have an in, in invention that you want to patent, it must be new, it must involve an inventive step, and it must be industrially applicable, you know? And new means not known to the public before. So it was not in the public domain before. It is not obvious to a skilled person. So it is truly an invention with something, with an inventive step. So it's not obvious to a skilled person. And it can be manufactured or used industrially. This is the industrially applicable or commercially applicable requirement. So I refer to this as the big three. Usually, no matter where you are, usually these three aspects are examined 
by the patent office when somebody applies for a patent. A patent application usually consists of these items, a request for grant, and this is a good example for, for IP law. Usually we, we, we can say application or petition, maybe. Most IP offices call it a request for grant in English. The application must also describe the invention. The application must include several claims. I will talk about what that means. If there are any drawings, we include them. And an abstract is a summary that you have to provide at the end of your patent application. When you studied legal English, you already know the word claim. Usually a claim is something you demand. Somebody owes you money, for example, and you demand and you claim money from that person. Or you suffered, let's say, damage, and you claim damages from somebody because you've been injured or something went wrong with a contract you entered into, then you might have a damages claim or a money claim or some claim for breach of contract, for example. In patent law, a claim defines the subject matter for which patent protection is sought in terms of its technical features. So claims describe the technical features of a patent. And the patent application is full of these claims. You know, often people have several technical features which they describe, which are characteristic for the patent. Um, I've put in a just an example here from a patent application. We don't have to go through this. It's it's quite technical. And this is the other thing. When you are interested in uh, IP law, and in particular in patent law, uh, you must also have an interest in the technical side of things, you know. Patent attorneys are not actually lawyers, people who studied law. They are people who have a background in engineering, or biochemistry or pharmacy. So they come from a, a natural science background. And they have a degree in, in biochemistry or engineering or whatever. And then they do a training for several years to become patent attorneys. But their background in most cases is not a legal background. It's a technical background in engineering biochemistry or a similar field, which is important to understand, you know, the technical dimensions of certain inventions, quite important. Another thing we need to talk about is the term infringement. Now, once you have got protection, nobody else is allowed to use it without your authorization. But if somebody does that, nevertheless, produces, let's say, a prototype of something that is actually protected by you. In other words, somebody steals your ideas. This is an infringement. Your IP rights are infringed upon. You probably know from your legal English classes the word breach and violate. Now, there are three words in legal English you need to know when it comes to yeah, breaching something. You can breach something, you can violate something, and you can infringe something. The best word is breach, because you can use breach for all sorts of things. You can breach the law, you can breach a contract, you can breach principles, agreements, rules, obligations, duties, lots of things you can breach. Violate is a bit narrower. Violate, as well as infringe, is for rights. So usually we don't use the words violate and infringe when we refer to contracts, but when we refer to rights. For example, human rights violation or copyright infringement. In this case, patent infringement or 
trademark infringement. So the word infringement is used particularly often in the world of intellectual property. You infringe patents, you infringe trademarks, you infringe, you infringe IP rights. Now, if that happens, you have an array of remedies. Remedies is a word I'm sure you've come across as well when you've studied legal English. So you have certain rights or things you can do. You can stop the infringing activities. So you can write a warning letter and send it to the person that infringes your patent, also called the infringer. Warning letter saying, hey, I've realized you've been doing this. You can combine this with a cease and desist letter. Cease and desist is just another word for stop. So you ask the infringer to sign a cease and desist letter where the infringer says, okay, I will not do this anymore. I accept this is your patent. This is your right. I'm wrong. I will not do it anymore. Cease and desist. And then another remedy is what we refer to as injunctive relief or getting a preliminary injunction from a court. This is actually when you go to court. A warning letter is out of court. A cease and desist letter is out of court, where simply the parties agree on something or where the parties' lawyers communicate and agree on something. Injunctive relief happens when the infringer does not react or does not comply, then you can apply for an injunction, which means the court will order the infringer to stop its infringing activities. Then there is a number of other remedies or rights you have as the patent owner. owner. You can request information about any money the infringer has made by using your patent. This is called rendering of accounts. So it's basically an account the infringer has to give you where you can see exactly what the infringer has generated in terms of sales or money. Yeah? So this is like disclosing the money you have made, rendering of accounts. Further rights you have as a patent owner, you can ask for a delivery up of the products that the infringer has produced or used. You can ask the infringer to destroy the products. And you can ask the infringer to recall the products if they are already in some kind of distribution chain. You know, often infringing products have are already being sold. So they are with sellers, they are with distributors, you know, and they are in the chain. And then you can ask the infringer to make sure that your patent or the product for which you have a patent on, and it's your right to use it, is not sold anymore and it's removed from sales. So this is a very nice overview of infringement because there are two sides. There are two sides to patents. One is getting a patent. So this is the application process. We call this prosecution. Patent prosecution is the activity from applying for a patent to getting a patent granted by an intellectual property office. Then we have the patent. And the other side is the infringement. We call this enforcement of patents. So first you get your patent protected and later on you enforce it by monitoring the market and by making sure that nobody else uses your invention, your patent without permission. Okay, fantastic. Let's talk about trademarks for a moment. The first interesting thing is the spelling, of course. I put in here, in US English, it's one word. In British English, it's 
two words, okay? Uh, trademarks are signs to identify products. This can be a word. This can be a figure or an image, or it, com it can be a combination of both, yeah? And these things you can protect as signs to distinguish your products. I showed you the Coca-Cola logo and also the Coca-Cola bottle. Both are protected around the world. In many countries, you can also protect these things here as trademarks. And when we, when we talk about trademark protection, we look at so-called classes. There is an international classification of goods and services. Um, in fact, there are 45 classes, 34 for goods and 11 for services. So depending on what you want to protect, depending on what you want to register as a trademark, you have to name certain classes. It can be one class or it can be several classes. And here you see the 45 classes. This is called Nice classification, named after the city Nice in Italy. Um, and you see the 45 classes here. So whenever you want to protect the trademark, um, then you should name these classes. How can you get to IP protection? There are basically three ways. There's a national, regional, and an international route. And this all refers to the offices that are in place um, around the world. Many countries have a national IP office. So those IP offices, they grant national protection in the country, in the jurisdiction you are in. Then we have regional offices in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in, in South America, where you can obtain protection in a geographical area covering several countries. And um, there's also an international route through which you can get protection in many countries, more than 100, by using just one, one application. And these applications or these routes take us through the World Intellectual Property Organization's uh, WIPO or WIPO. I will talk about that in a moment. Um, I made a mistake. I said the city of Nice is in Italy, the city of Nice is in France. I'm sorry. This is the place where the states agreed on these classes. So the agreement was reached in the city of Nice and the 45 classes were fixed. And these are basically used all around the world. Let's take a look at the proceedings. So I just would like to give you one example for a national route and one example for a regional route and one for an international. So this is how things work in Germany. This is an example for a national route. Excuse me, so to go here. Yo. So as you can see here, you have an invention, you file a patent application, then there is a first examination in this first examination, um, the examiner checks for obvious deficiencies. Obvious de deficiencies are very obvious or apparent mistakes that have been made in the uh, examination. Then the applicant files an examination request. And then a phase, which is the main examination procedure is entered into. And there are then um, two things at the end. Either the patent is refused or the patent is granted. 
if the patent office comes to the conclusion all the requirements have been met, this is a patentable invention, they will grant the patent. If not, they will refuse it. So the terms grant and refusal are used here for saying yes and no. The word prior art searches refers to a search an office always conducts to look for yeah, things which have been there before or already. So this is, this is basically a check whether it is really new and involve an inventive step. Because pr prior art means there are other patents that already protect the same thing. So, or the invention has already been made by someone else. This would be, then we would have a case of prior art. Once granted, patents are published. And then third parties have the chance to file an opposition. An opposition is a procedural remedy that is examined by the patent office. If the opposition is declined, then the patent is protected for up to 20 years. Opposition proceedings can also result in two things. Either the patent is maintained at the end or the patent is revoked. Revoked means the patent was granted and later it's withdrawn, revoked. Yeah, Revoke is a word you certainly know from your contract law classes yeah? because you can make an offer and you can revoke an offer. You can revoke a declaration. You can revoke a statement. Uh, there's a couple of things you can revoke. The remedies which are mentioned here, the procedural remedies are appeal if your patent application is refused, appeal when your patent is revoked, oops, and an appeal even if the patent is maintained. So if you have a third party that filed an opposition, the patent office said, no, we maintain the patent, everything is okay. Then there can still be an appeal. And while opposition proceedings are with the IP office, appeal proceedings go to a dedicated court. In Germany, it's the Federal Patent Court. And in Europe, we also have a new court that was established this year called the Unified Patent Court, which is also in operation now. So this is basically an overview of how things work in Germany, but they work similarly in, in many other countries. So you have an application, you have a, a grant procedure, and you have several remedies, you know, if you are unhappy with a decision. Here on the right hand side, we've got the proceedings with the EPO. The EPO is the European Patent Office. Here again, you file an application. You do this when you want to get protection in several countries, not just in one, such as Germany, but you want to get protection all over Europe and a number of other countries that are also part of the uh, of the treaty. So European Patent Office, again, you've got an examination on filing. Then the application is either refused or deemed withdrawn. It's deemed withdrawn when the applicant fails to meet certain deadlines or to pay certain fees that he's been asked to pay. Then an application can be deemed withdrawn, although there's there has not been an active withdrawal of the application, but something you were supposed to do was not done. Money, a fee paid or an answer given or whatever. 
Otherwise, a search report will be prepared, a written opinion by the examiner. Uh, again, the patent will be published, usually after 18 months after filing. Then there is what the EPO calls a substantive examination. So this is the main, you've got one examination on filing, which is just a formal one. And then you've got a, substan a substantive examination where they look deep into the matter. And then without going into further details here, you know, um, they arrive at a grant or a refusal. Of course, the patent specification, so the description, everything about the invention is published. And once the patent has been granted, again, also on the European level, there can be opposition proceedings. There can also be limitation or revocation proceedings. Limitation means the scope for which a patent has been granted might be limited because a third party raised objections, filed an opposition and said, I've got a similar patent. You must limit the patent or the patent can even be revoked. Yeah, And revoked means it does not exist anymore. So the right is taken away from you. The result might be threefold. At the end, either the patent is, is maintained. This is all about if there is an opposition. If there is no opposition, it's just granted. Okay, but only if you go into opposition proceedings, then you end up either with the patent maintained as granted or patent maintained as amended. You know, the parties can also agree to, to amend the patent in a certain way or the patent revoked. If the patent office says this opposition was just justified. Okay, so this is the overview. On the left, we've got a national route. Germany, on the right, we've got the European route. As you can see, very similar. There's always an application. Uh, there are certain procedural remedies, such as an opposition and an appeal. Third parties can file oppositions. Patents are either granted or refused. And later, if they were granted, later they can also be revoked. This diagram shows you the international route it looks a bit complicated, but international route means you go for, you go through the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, and by filing one application, you can get protection in more than 150 countries. So instead of filing, if, if somebody wants to protect a patent worldwide, not just in one country or in one region, it could make sense instead of filing separate applications everywhere to file one international application. Here you see a timeline. So we've got 18 months until the application is published. So this is basically a rule that is, that is applied everywhere, whether you go national, regional or international. And then after 30 months, the uh, the WIPO phase is usually is usually uh, finished or completed, and then you go into a national phase entry. The abbreviation PCT stands for Patent Corporation Treaty. This is the treaty on which this is based. Yeah, the treaty is basically um, a contract between states. So all the one hundred and fifty three states that are um, a member to this treaty, they go through this route, they accept these sort of applications. You always have a so-called receiving office. This is the office in your own country or a regional one, such as the European Patent Office or the Asian or the African one. And then your application is transmitted to VIPO and then it goes this way. And then with one application, you can get protection in so many countries. I believe 153 or 157 at the moment. And it's constantly growing. A quick word on the EU trademark. So national protection is one thing. There's also a European Union trademark. You go through the 
appropriate IP office. This is the EU IPO in uh, Alicante in Spain. It involves an examination period, an opposition period, and then the registration. So it's basically filing an application. The application is published. Third parties might have an opposition because they say, hey, I've got a trademark that's similar. You know, you cannot, you cannot get trademark protection when there is already a similar trademark that consumers might confuse it with, you know, a similar name, a similar logo, a similar image or picture. Uh, that is not okay. So every trademark office always checks what they call a likelihood of confusion. And they apply a likelihood of confusion test. If they say this, what you apply for here is likely to be confused with an existing trademark, then they will refuse your application. Yeah, This is what they call a ground for refusal. This is the European one. And also for trademarks, you can go through WIPO again. So you go through your national or your regional office. This is uh, the first step. Then your application is forwarded to WIPO. And then it goes basically back to all the countries where you seek trademark protection. Yeah. Um, the contracting parties are all the states which have been named in your trademark application. So you file your application and you say, I would like to get protection in, in these countries and you name them. And then it goes exactly like this. You go through your national office at the beginning or your regional one. Your application is forwarded to uh, WIPO. They conduct a formal examination, as you can see here, excuse me, a formal examination. They register the mark in the International Register. They publish the mark. And they issue a certificate of registration. And then in stage three, which you see here, stage three, this is the last stage, the application is sent by WIPO to all the states that have been named. These are called the contracting parties because they are contracting parties to the treaty laying the foundation to the international trademark registration. Quick, um, a quick look at the USA. You know, terminology is really important and it's really, really complicated because as I told you, you will come across lots and lots of terms you, are, you will not have learned in other areas of law. When you go through the United States Patent and Trademark Office, you come across all of these words, these are the different steps, you know, once you filed your application, you receive, you get a filing receipt, a notice of acceptance, notice to file missing parts. This is when the examiner says, oh, something is missing, you know, or there are some deficiencies in your application. There's a publication, there's an office action, which is usually an official letter from the IP office, notice of allowance. In the USA means, yes, we have granted your patent. And then there's a formal issue notification where you also get your certificate then. Yeah. So depending on the country you're dealing with, UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, you know, I mean, there's lots of English speaking countries in the world. And while a lot of the terminology is similar, there are still some regional differences you have to get used to should you ever work in the area of intellectual property law, which is a very, very international area. Finally, some language points. IP rights can be protected, limited, revoked, declared null, void, or invalid. Yeah. Usually, uh, you know, any patent can later be declared null and void. 
in court proceedings called nullity action, which is right here. This is not available in every country, but many jurisdictions have that. So there is already a patent. It has been granted. It, it has been even around for several years, but it was not discovered by another patent owner that there might be an infringement, you know, that he has already protected a similar, a similar invention. Then you can still bring a nullity action and this can lead to a null, void, or invalid patent. This is what offices and courts can do. This is what you do as an applicant. You can file a patent application and you can get protection, but you can also change your mind later. You might say at some stage, after 5, 10, 15 years, as the patent owner, oh, I don't own the patent, I don't need the patent anymore, I don't need protection anymore, and then you can abandon it. Abandon means you give it up. You give it up. Yeah. So you can protect, but you can also abandon. I talked about nullity action. I talked about office action. Office action are official letters or official communication you receive from an IP office. These letters are often referred to as office action. And then I told you, depending on the country you're dealing with, there may be further terms to get familiar with. So intellectual property law is, is truly, and this is the wrap up here, my summary, let us take a look. When you work, study, teach, or translate in the world of IP, you cannot use the English you normally use. You must familiarize yourself with the language of patents and trademarks, the language of the laws regulating them, and the language of the offices granting them. You must accept that IP regulations and offices mandate a vocabulary that can be quite special, quite technical, and quite different from ordinary English. Down here, I've collected some key vocabulary for you. Um, I think this session is recorded and you can watch it later at any time. I think I've covered most of these words. Exploit means to use. Disclose is the features you have to disclose. I talked about infringement. Damages is one of the main remedies you have in case of infringement. I talked about delivery up, destruction, recall, cease and desist to stop. The request is the word that is used for an application in patent and trademark matters. Claims describe the technical features of a patent. There's always an examination by the office and the patent is then granted or refused in the end. Procedural remedies are opposition and appeal. A patent might be limited, revoked, or declared null. And among the trademarks or in the world of trademarks, we've got an array of different marks, words, figures, or combination thereof. There are certain classes and the classes fall into the so-called niece classification. So this is the end of my talk today, of my lecture to the world of intellectual property. Um, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn if you like. I publish at least one article on Legal English every month on different areas of law. Here you can see one on uh, IP I, I published, but there's lots of other things. There is uh, one on litigation. There is one on common mistakes. There's one on uh, similar words, which we should not confuse, polysemy, and many, many other topics, UK versus US English as well. The good thing about these articles is they are not just freely accessible, but they don't take a lot of time to read. I usually keep them very concise, very short and on the point. So as you can see here, it usually takes you only three minutes to read any of these articles. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Good luck with uh, intellectual property law, should you decide to get into that area. 
And please enjoy the rest of the Legal English Week with all the other lectures coming up. Goodbye. Okay. Take care. Uh, can I have a word? Am I audible now? Yes, yes. yes mm -hmm. I can hear you. Mr. Musa, thank you very much for your uh, webinar today. It is very informative. I think uh, it will be very helpful to our students too. And now students, you're welcome to ask questions if you have. If you have any questions, students, please be active. Okay, some of the students they had some kind of technological something, technical problem. That's why they couldn't be audible. But I'm going to ask what they have, what they have asked. Okay, Mr. Um, Mitsu, do you have time to answer some questions that I just have left? You know what it means if there are no questions. It means I've mastered everything, you know? That's what it means. Yeah, thank you very much, actually. It was great. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I do hope you guys heard me <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I heard you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Do you have any questions, students? Now we have an expert in the language of intellectual property law. We can ask any question related to this topic. Microphone is yawning. Can, can, can you turn on your microphone? We should have already filed uh, the protection, any kind of intellectual property protection in our country.
what was there a question if there was please rephrase it because i didn't i didn't hear it yes 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 we do have question just a moment someone is right someone is typing the question in the chat box I've also put on the LinkedIn thing in the in the chat where you Thank can you so much. access yes. the articles, you know. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to copy it and then share in our Telegram channels. Oops. None? Okay, here, the question. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, would, it ha would it be helpful if we have a file of protection and we go to other state and want to take one? This is a question. Yeah, I mean that 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 might ha might help. You mean when you already have protected something in your country, for example, in yeah. in Uzbekistan, and then you you select other countries. The problem is, of course, in every country you seek protection, you need a local agent, which means a local attorney. So this is also a question of costs. You know, in every jurisdiction you file an application usually you can't do it on your own. Usually you need a local expert who's familiar with the local jurisdiction and the country and the office, and then you can uh, do it. Alternatively, you can take the international route, as I, as I showed you, you know. Basically, you file one application and you go through the international route. I, I haven't checked whether Uzbekistan is a, is a contracting party, but uh, there is an IP office in Tashkent, uh, I looked at the website. Um, well, I couldn't read it, it's only in Uzbek, but anyway, I, there is an IP office. And um, if you are a party to the Patent Corporation Treaty, you can just do it through your local office. You say, I file an international application and they will forward it. So once the patent has already been granted in your country, it definitely helps. But going to other countries means either going to every single country you're interested in, or going through a regional office, such as the European one, or the African or the Asian one, or the international one. So it all depends how many markets are relevant for you and your invention and your patent, and in how many countries you believe you need protection. Thank you. Thank you. And next question, I have a next question that intrigued me a lot. Um, the, I would like to know about the extension of copyright. Uh, uh, how long can it be valid in Germany? 70 years. 70 years, that's the same as Uzbekistan. Yeah, yeah. I think this is pretty much, uh, pretty much the same. I mean, copyright is something where you don't go through an IP office. Copyright just arises once you've produced your work of art or your literature mm -hmm. text or whatever, mm -hmm. then you are automatically the copyright owner and copyright expires after 70 years. Okay. So um, authors that were published more than 70 years ago can now be used free of charge, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. can copy them, you can take their ideas. And mm -hmm. um, we've got this, this expiry with patents after 20 years, but copyright is 70 years, mm -hmm. so anybody can then use um, literary works, basically, and market Is it going to be them. fair use? Sorry? Is it going to be fair use after 70 years? Say again? It's fair use, right of fair use. 
so that everyone. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's right of fair use. That's correct. Yes. And <laughs> we we see it. You know, we see it after twenty years with patents. You know, um, that you get a lot of other producers that produce the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like the same capsules for coffee machines, the same tea bags, the same whatever. We also see it in in the in the pharmaceutical business. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the protection of aspirin, which is a famous um, painkiller when you have headache, mm -hmm. um, of course, expired after 20 years. And we've got lots of other producers that produce these painkillers with the same ingredients now, mm -hmm. but they are just not called aspirin. They've got lots of other names. Mm -hmm. And this is always what happens when you, okay. when this has expired. Okay. Um, and my next question I'm really sorry for being long here. And my next question, um, if I want to get a, pa a patent or copyright, which um, body of the government should I apply my documents? <laughs> you mean? Is it, that is interesting. You, yeah, you mean in, in Uzbekistan? No, 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 in Germany. Oh, in Germany. Yeah. Yes, now well, I'm comparing. For, no, for in our, in our country, we need to apply our documents to the Minister of Justice. Okay. No, in yes. Germany we have an in Germany and um in Germany we have an independent office, you know. We've got uh -huh. we've got a patent and trademark office that mm. handles everything. In some countries you've got separate offices for patents and trademarks. Mm-hmm. On the European uh, level, there are two separate offices. I showed you the routes. There's a European patent office, but they only handle patents. And then there's an, a trademark office called EU IPO. They're responsible for patents. Mm -hmm. Copyrights are not registered because copyrights arise automatically. You can't register a copyright with any office here. Uh, you can only register patents, trademarks, designs, mm -hmm. utility models. You know, mm. so there's um, these are the things you can protect. Copyright is something that arises automatically with the creation of your work I see. and expires mm. automatically after 70 years. Uh -huh. mm. Now, this is a difference. Okay, thank you. Ah, um, Mr. Mustu. Do you have a YouTube channel as well that we can follow? Can you please the, share the link? I'm not a YouTuber and I'm not <laughs> a, and I'm not an influencer. <laughs> but but I know that uh, Tashkent State University has a YouTube channel. At yes. least I saw some of the Legal English Week lectures uh, before on YouTube, so that is mm. possible to watch. Mm -hmm. I don't have a YouTube channel myself. There are only other people that have put up videos with me, um, mainly Tashkent State University. And then uh, there's also a conference presentation online. When you just put in my name in YouTube, you will find it. But that's about, it's also about teaching uh, legal English, actually, but more the general one, you know, mm -hmm. not the IP one. It's about legal English in general. So these are the mm -hmm. things that are online. I'm very sorry. I mm -hmm. don't have a YouTube channel. I'm not on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'm not on Snapchat. Only on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> and um, we're going to upload today's lecture on YouTube, our channel, um, channel of Foreign Languages Department. Of course, if you, uh, if you grant us the permission, because today we have talked about intellectual property law, right? Today's lecture is your intellectual property. That is why if you grant us a permission, then we will upload. Of course. I can I can even send you the slides if you want to forward them or, or use them. Uh, that's possible as well. Because there's a lot of information on there. Yes. And also all, all the language points, you know, there's a lot yeah. to digest in just one hour. And it's mm. it's better when you have it in front of you and then you can go through it again and, and, and read it. Yeah. Yes, this is our ultimate aim, to get our students uh, um, to get more information about intellectual property law. Is that all? Students, don't you have any question? 
I think they don't. Um, for today's lecture, thank you very much, Mr. Mutsu. Uh, as I said, today's class, today's lecture has been very informative and helpful and useful for our students and for us too, for teachers too. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And I wish you a great week with your other lectures. It's great. It's great to have this. So mm -hmm. thanks for having me and take care. And I really hope on behalf of our department, we will continue our cooperation for many years in Legal English Weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we invite. Goodbye then. <laughs>